Well, happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to our Thursday noon check-in with Embrace. My name is Christina, and I'm one of our associate pastors, and I'm grateful to be here with you all today. We're getting a little bit of a late start, but we've got a treat in store. We get to hear from Pastor Greg Gallagher, uh, which is our lead pastor, John's dad, actually, um, and so I'm looking forward to that. But I am grateful that you are here, um, and if you are new or um, visiting with us via this stream today, please make sure and, and say hey and let us know. In fact, if you're on the stream at all, it'd be great for you to say hey and to greet one another. Um, the comment section of this Facebook live stream is one of the best things about the platform. I love getting to see you all pop up in there and to interact with you. And, and so please do comment all throughout the time today. Um, I believe Pastor Greg is on here with us as well and will respond to some of your comments and interact with you as you um, comment during the time that he shares. So please know that that's available for you today. Just a couple of quick announcements. We are, of course, in the season of Advent. And you have joined us during the second week of Advent. The first week of Advent, our theme focus was holding on to hope. The second week is about bringing peace. And we have two more weeks of Advent before we celebrate together the mystery of Christmas. So I hope that you're finding ways to be intentional in celebrating Advent and um, invite you to join us for all of the different ways that we are gathering together as a community virtually this Advent season. We will gather together for worship on Sunday at 11 a.m. here on Facebook Live. We also are having a special Advent worship experience. So that's more than just music. There will be scripture and testimony and some other neat elements as well. So we hope you can join us for that. It'll be December 19th at 7 p.m. So we hope we can see you there. Um, that'll be a premiere video, so we'll be in the comments with you watching it all together for the first time. And without any further ado, I want to invite um, Pastor Greg Gallagher to share his devotion with us for today. And when he's finished, we'll come back on and close together. And if you have any prayer requests, we will cover those together at the end as well. So feel free to type those in the comments as we go along. Good afternoon, Embrace. It's good to be with you again for another one of these uh, noon check-ins. And of course, we find ourselves at the midpoint with this season of Advent as we are journeying together through a season of prayer and reflection and, and reading uh, as a community of faith, albeit online, uh, separate from each other, but still together in this marvelous way through technology. And it is a good thing. And I'm thankful that I can share it with you from uh, my home here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Of course, I'm John's dad. And I'm so honored that he has asked me to once again lead in a time of devotion. Uh, I want to share a theme that has uh, really been on my heart and mind a lot uh, these days. As I was walking in my other son's neighborhood recently with our grandsons, uh, I saw a bumper sticker on the back of a car that said, Humankind, in two colors, the word human in one color, kind in another. And then underneath this word, was the phrase, be both. Humankind, be both. And I thought, man, that is a message that is certainly needed in our day, isn't it? Uh, to be human, to be more vulnerable and transparent and real with one another, uh, to stop playing games with each other and being so arrogant and even untrue in who we actually are. Uh, but to admit that we're people in need of grace and of love and, and of compassion and kindness, but also to be kind then in our relationships with one another. And I don't know what your Christmas list looks like and what you're planning to give other people or what you're hoping to receive, but if there's anything that we can give to other people, every single one of us, and also something we need to receive from others, it is kindness, human kindness. So the scripture that I want to read, read this morning is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? Jesus answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. 
But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think, Jesus asked, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the lawyer answered, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Would you pray with me? God, we pray now that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in these next few moments as we think about what it means to be a kind disciple of Jesus. And it's in his name, name we pray. Amen. Well, it's been over a decade ago that USA Today did a cover story on the incivility and rudeness of American culture. And they mentioned the problem with uh, hate groups and road rage and lewd and violent uh, entertainment, uh, twisted untrue political ads, mean-spirited comedy routines, uh, so many symptoms of a deeper problem in our culture that 89% of Americans said was very serious uh, back over a decade ago. It seems to me things have not changed in the last decade. In fact, they may have gotten worse. Uh, a poll done in 2016 of teenagers discovered that nine in 10 of them said that America was an unkind place to live. And 96% of them said this was contributing to bullying in the public school. Now this is what our kids are saying about the country they live in and the impact it's having on them and on our schools. When I was a kid and even into adulthood, my mother used to, to say to us, be ye kind to one another. Uh, no doubt something that her grandparents, who were godly people, taught her. It's a Bible verse, Ephesians 4.32. Mother didn't tell us it was in the scripture. She just told us this is how we should behave. And it was much later that I realized that this was a quote from the King James Bible. My dad always said, kill them with kindness. And that, that may be a mixed message there, killing kindness, the two go together, I don't know. But, but I think what my dad was trying to teach me, and it stuck, is that um, you can disarm your enemies who might dislike you if you'll simply be kind to them. In the book, Kindness Reaching Out to Others, the story is told of a professor who gave his students, his seminary students, uh, an assignment to preach, uh, prepare and preach a sermon on the parable of the Good Samaritan, the passage that I just read out of Luke chapter 10. Uh, on the day that they were to come to class and to preach it, however, he uh, had some other students strategically place themselves throughout campus and intervene with each one of these uh, students and, um, and plead with them. They had an urgent need. They needed help. Can you come with me? And without fail, every single one of them said, I can't come. I have a sermon to preach on the Good Samaritan. <laughs> so you'll just have to find somebody else to help you with your problem. Just what is kindness? Well, we know it when we see it, don't we? Absolutely. Uh, when uh, we look at the scriptures, however, uh, we find a very powerful word in the Hebrew. It's called hesed. Uh, Connie's uh, niece, Julie Beth, and her husband, Matt, when they had their first son, Owen, uh, eight years ago, I thought it was so wonderful that they gave him this Hebrew word, C-H-E-S-E-D, Hesed, as his middle name, 
which means love, loving kindness, uh, mercy, and pity. There are nearly 250 references in the Old Testament that use this word either to refer directly to God or the behavior God has toward us or we are to have toward one another. Psalm 17, 7 says, show your marvelous loving kindness. Psalm 117 verse 2 says, his merciful kindness is great toward us. And Psalm 145, 17 says, the Lord is filled with kindness. And in the New Testament, there are scores of additional verses that speak of the kindness of the Lord. Jesus said, we're to love our enemies, to do good to them, to lend to them, expecting nothing in return. He says, your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High for he is kind. The Lord is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked, Luke 6, 35. In Titus 3, verses 4 through 5, some of my favorite verses in the scriptures, when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. And then Ephesians 2, 7, Paul says to the, refers to the, uh, the incredible wealth of his grace and his kindness toward us uh, in the gift of of God's Son to the world. The fruit of the Spirit, we know, includes kindness. And love is patient, 1 Corinthians 13 says, and love is kind. The bottom line in the Bible is that God is a kind God. Our Savior, Jesus, is a kind Savior, and He expects us the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who brings the fruit of Jesus' character to our lives, who makes it possible for us to have the power and the desire, the motivation to be kind, brings that to bear in our lives. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, kind as they are, want us to be the same way in our relationships with other people. Now, this uh, passage of Scripture that we looked at this morning uh, is one that uh, is so powerful um, in that it talks about uh, another one of those public debates that Jesus had with uh, one of the religious leaders. You know, the Pharisees and the scribes, the lawyers, those who were experts in the Mosaic law, frequently came to test Jesus. They were intrigued by his teaching, no doubt convicted at times by what he said, but they also disagreed with him because it challenged their traditions and their understanding of, of, of the level of righteousness that was, that was necessary in order to enter the kingdom of God. Um, and, and here we see Jesus once again in a debate with someone. The expert was concerned about eternal life, and he basically says, you know, how good do I have to be, Jesus, in order to enter the kingdom, to have life? And Jesus says, well, what did you learn in law school? And he said, well, uh, I learned that we're supposed to uh, love the Lord our God with, with our whole being and our neighbor as ourself. He was drawing from the Shema in Deuteronomy and the commandment to love our neighbor in Leviticus chapter 19. And Jesus said, yep, you've got it down. You are correct indeed. But, but the lawyer's first motive to test Jesus wasn't the whole story. He also had a second motive which was to justify himself, to defend his own limited interpretation of the law of Moses, and especially uh, what his obligation was to a neighbor. Now, here we find um, probably this kind of internal conflict with his integrity between his beliefs and what he was seeing and hearing from Jesus and how that impacted his own behavior. So the lawyer states the heart of the law is to love, but his own words proved too much to him because he knew that he had not loved his neighbor as he had loved himself because his definition of neighbor was lacking. And that's where the parable draws from the despised Samaritans to lift up an example of a virtuous, kind man. Two religious people pass by, a priest, 
possibly completing his duties at the temple on his way home, and another, a Levite, who might have been on his way to the temple, and both did not stop. They passed by the other side. When they saw this, this half-dead man, perhaps his dress identified him, his, his ethnicity made it clear to them that he was not a Jew, that he was a Samaritan uh, or some other ethnic uh, you know, minority. Uh, but he may have very well been a fellow Jew. The, Jew. the scripture doesn't tell us. But it was a Samaritan who was not one of them, Jesus says, who stopped and helped him and who bound up his wounds and put him on his animal and took him to an inn and paid whatever it cost to take care of him in order that his health be restored. And so Jesus says to the lawyer, um, who do you think was a neighbor to him? And the lawyer, no doubt, saw clearly, saw clearly that it was the one who was kind, who showed hesed to him, loving kindness to the stranger, to the wounded one. And the fact that, that Jesus used a Samaritan as an example of a kind and virtuous life is very, very significant because the Jews, again, despised the Samaritans. They were um, seen as half-breed, ethnically and religiously. Uh, they were a remnant from hundreds of years previously when the Assyrians came in and took the northern captivity into, uh, into exile. And they left a few Jews behind. And those Jews that were left behind um, began to intermarry with, with the occupiers who moved into the land. And, and they adopted some of their religious practices. They intermarried with their daughters and sons. And soon they had their own religious cultic practices that, that really set them apart. They were no longer Jews. They resembled Judaism in some respects, and had a temple in Samaria, but they were not purebreds. Uh, they were heretics. And so Jews traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem on pilgrimage or to Judea on business went out of their way to avoid Samaria. They crossed over the Jordan River, went into the Perean wilderness, and went south, and then came up the Jericho Road to Jerusalem. Uh, going well out of their way to avoid the hated Samaritans. Man, it was Jesus in his ministry who traveled straight through Samaria more than once and preached the kingdom that was coming and healed the sick and fed the hungry and and uh, brought redemption and hope to a Samaritan woman. And even when he was rejected, as he was in more than one Samaritan village, no doubt, um, showed compassion for the people, even though two of his disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, were wanting to call down fire from heaven to destroy the people, these Samaritans. So here we find Jesus lifting up for them someone that would not be expected to be an example of a virtuous person, a Samaritan. Good Samaritan, again, has become um, symbolic of what it means to be compassionate and caring. Uh, it's on hospitals and orphanages. Samaritan's Purse, which is associated especially with this time of the year in Operation Christmas Child, um, is, is all uh, wrapped up in this idea of, of exceeding mercy loving kindness uh, to others. And, um, and so uh, Samaritan has come to mean something very, very different in our day. Understanding these deepest differences, Jesus uh, engaged the Samaritans in dialogue and cared for them and loved them just where they are. And that same kind of kindness is something that we can and should extend to others. Uh, a favorite quote of mine that I can't remember where it came from, so I don't have the author. I just had the quotation says this, the Lord Jesus came into an unkind world. It was literally a dog eat dog, every man for himself world. 
There were no organizations of mercy, no mental institutions, no hospitals, no orphanages. Yet when Jesus came, he poured the milk of human kindness into every bowl of human suffering. I believe that one of the greatest proofs of genuine Christian uh, discipleship, of a life that is owned by God, that belongs to Christ, is kindness. It's also the mark, I think, in Scripture of an authentic leader. You know, I had a bishop many years ago uh, who was smart and powerful and very much in control, but he was not very kind. He got things done, but he had this widespread uh, reputation of being overbearing and rude, which I experienced firsthand with him on more than one occasion. Now, it may be good to be smart, productive, and strong in our culture, but it is more important to be kind. Kindness um, motivates people to do things more than toughness ever can. It is not a sign of weakness to be kind. It is a sign of great strength. And Jesus never tells us to pass judgment on people. That's not our job. He says God will take care of that. We are to extend love and, and mercy and kindness to forgive our enemies um, as much as possible. And so, um, you know, I don't know what your Christmas list look like looks like this year, what you're planning to give others, but I tell you, everyone can give and everyone needs to receive this gift of kindness. So how can I express kindness today? How can you express kindness every day that remains in Advent and in the days to follow in the season of Christmas? Um, Mark Twain was right when he wrote, kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Would you uh, have a word of prayer with me today? Lord, I pray that you will birth in us uh, a, a spirit of kindness that, uh, that we will look for ways, even in this time of, of uh, struggle, uh, of difficulty because of this pandemic, to look for ways that we can extend your loving kindness and your mercy and your grace uh, and your love to others. Uh, Lord, help us to be creative and innovative uh, help us to uh, stay engaged as best we can with our culture in this time. Uh, to speak a word of truth when there is so much falsehood being spoken. To, to speak a word of love in the midst of so much hatred and discrimination and prejudice. To accept one another and to love each other as you, Father, in your Son, the Christ, the Savior, have done for each one of us. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you all. You have a blessed Advent and Christmas. I will see you again sometime in January on one of these Thursday noon check-ins. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Greg, for that word and for praying over us today to help us have a heart of kindness in this Advent season. I appreciate that and we'll take that to heart today. Thank you all for being with us and joining us. Um, I'll remind you, if you have prayer requests, you can always email them to prayer at embraceyourcity.com and our prayer team will keep those confidential but partner with you in prayer and lift you up as you have need. So please do take advantage of that. And I hope that we will see you again soon, be able to gather with you again here on Facebook Live Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And until then, I pray you all have a blessed week.